flying over the city in the third day of aerial bombardment. And giving back to the community, we meet some of the Syrian refugees making a new life for themselves here in the UK. Playing football is my hobby. When I came here and received that warm welcome, I decided to help train their kids. Also coming up, UKIP denies the party misspent hundreds of thousands of euros of EU funding while campaigning for Brexit. And we'll take a look at the lighter side of nature photography, the picture-perfect wildlife snaps with a difference. Monitors in Syria say 25 civilians have been killed in the latest bombing of rebel-held neighborhoods in the city of Aleppo. Syrian government forces began a renewed assault in the city on Tuesday. It's also been reported that a Russian cruise missile was seen heading over Aleppo. Thomas Morgan reports. A rare miracle in East Aleppo. A small boy rescued from the rubble. He's shaken up, but alive, and like so many others. For the third day in a row, the Syrian government have continued with its aerial bombardment on the city. Today, the death toll has been rising rapidly, exceeding double figures in a matter of hours. Around 30 civilians have been killed so far, with activists saying that number is much higher. Much of the footage from today's attacks is too graphic to be broadcast. With many trapped and decimated buildings, any rescue operation has been made even harder with a constant threat of yet another explosion. And this morning at 10 a.m., video footage taken by a charity worker on the ground allegedly showing a Russian caliber cruise missile seen heading towards Aleppo. It's not clear whether the missile hit the city. The Russians have denied their firing on the war-ravaged city. Their targets have been terrorists and rebel groups in Idlib and Homs. But as the fighting continues across northern Syria in Aleppo, with food stocks on the brink of running out, this winter will be the harshest of any before. Thomas Morgan, BBC News, Beirut. And some of the most vulnerable refugees fleeing heavily bombed cities in Syria have been brought to the UK after the British government agreed to take in 20,000 people by 2020. The first plane loads, uh, plane loads arrived a year ago today. And since then, well over 3,000 people have been resettled. Over a third live in Scotland, where they've been quietly rebuilding their lives. The members of one family share their story with our Scotland correspondent, Lorna Gordon. Set slowly, slowly. I'll rush. The newest coaching recruits to a community football club in Alloa. It's a game they played back in Syria before war forced them from their homes. Good. Yes. Now a chance to get back on the pitch and give something back to the area that has taken them in. <laughs> I am very thankful. They made us feel safe. Playing football is my hobby. When I came here and received that warm welcome, I decided to help train their kids. Those here are keen to help them settle in. We certainly want them to be integrated uh, and, and get involved in it. Um, and it sends a message to the community as well to say, look, these families are here. We understand the circumstances they've come from. Let's make an effort to try and welcome them. Those who have come under the British government's resettlement scheme are considered in particular need of help. The BBC understands over 3,000 are now living across the UK. Out of the 20,000 Syrians, the government has committed to resettling directly from the region in the next three years. This family had been living in what had been an ISIS-controlled part of Syria. Years of conflict and bombing drove them to a refugee camp where they were selected to come to Britain. You can't imagine how frightening it was. You could be sleeping and the next thing you know is the ceiling falling on you. The entire building could collapse in a matter of seconds. 
Now they feel secure. It is safe here and the law protects you. My children are safe at school where no one could harm them. I can't deny that I miss my home country, but the sense of safety and security here is making it up for me. In Scotland, almost every local authority has housed Syrians as part of this scheme. But many areas in Britain face pressures on housing, schools and health services and do not have the capacity to help. Do you like cheese? For these families, the aim now is to improve their English, get jobs. They say they want to do all they can to become part of this community, which has taken them in. Lorna Gordon, BBC News, Clackmannanshire. Well, Russia has said it hopes that U.S. President-elect Donald Trump will take a new approach to solving the Syrian crisis. Russian news agencies quoted Russia's deputy foreign minister, who also said that Russia had first contacted Mr. Trump's team to discuss matters in Syria. And the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will be the first foreign leader to meet U.S. President-elect Donald Trump when he visits New York later today. Mr. Trump has unsettled Japan with his pledge to make more make allies pay more for U.S. military support and his opposition to a trans-Pacific trade deal. Well, for more on this, I'm joined from our studio in Washington by Professor Walter Russell Mead, an expert on U.S. foreign policy from Bard College. Professor Mead, thank you for joining us. I wonder, is this a, a, a foreign policy coup for Shinzo Abe to score this first meeting with Donald Trump, or is this meeting going to be a little more than a handshake? Well, even if it's only a handshake, it'll certainly be a coup to be the first foreign leader to meet the new president-elect. So I'm sure uh, Ab Mr. Abe is feeling very good about that this morning. And do you think foreign leaders have a, have a window of opportunity to, uh, uh, to influence Donald Trump before he takes office? Well, I think they do. I think, um, you know, for example, uh, Mr. Abe has actually a good story to tell President-elect Trump. That is that you know, of all U.S. allies, Japan is one that really does take seriously helping to pay for its own defense, uh, helping to sort of be part of U.S. strategy in the Pacific, and Abe has taken a lot of leadership. So I wouldn't be surprised if the two of them actually managed to hit it off pretty well. I mean, a lot of people around the world will be watching this meeting quite closely to see how much stock Donald Trump places in these kind of long-held foreign uh, relationships. Uh, do you think that uh, Trump administration will really place a lot of effort in maintaining these long-held relationships, or do you think that every global relationship with the United States is up for a rethink at the moment? Well, I think uh, in the case of a country like Japan, which is the most important American ally in a region, the East Pacific, which is of long-standing great interest and is of interest to Mr. Trump as well as to others, I think Japan doesn't have to worry whether or not America will pay attention to it. Um, and, uh, and what about uh, the so, rest of Donald Trump's foreign policy? Do you think we're going to see any real dramatic uh, pledges, you know, dramatic shifts uh, along the lines of what he pledged during his campaign? You know, he, he does seem to have been consistent about a couple of things. Uh, one of them is it appears that he wants to focus more on ISIS and less on other threats in the Middle East. And some are arguing that this may actually give some substance to the idea of his wanting to work more closely with Russia in Syria. I don't know if that's true. Um, we've had really every American president since George W. Bush has come into office saying, OK, I'm going to make friends with Mr. Putin. I'm going to reset U.S.-Russia relations. And something goes wrong. I don't know if that will happen for Mr. Trump or not. OK, we'll have to wait and see. Professor Mee, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, has hosted her last summit with President Obama, hailing eight years of what she described as very close cooperation. In response, President Obama thanked her for her leadership. But warm words aside, it was foreign policy that dominated talks between the two allies in Berlin, as Jenny Hill reports. Well, this is Barack Obama's final official visit and final official meeting with the woman he calls his closest international ally. And after that meeting in Berlin today, 
Mrs. Merkel paid tribute to Barack Obama. This has been a very warm transatlantic partnership, and she thanked him for his achievements in the White House. This is the end of an eight-year cooperation that was very close indeed. From a German point of view, um, German-American and European-American American relations are a pillar of our foreign policy. Is, foreign policy, policy that is obviously guided by interests, but that is very much also committed to shared values. So we have a platform, democracy, freedom, and uh, respect of human rights that we would like to see respected all over the world, and also a what was supposed to have been a farewell tour has been rather overshadowed by concern in Berlin about the man who'll succeed Barack Obama in the White House. And after extensive talks today between Barack Obama and Mrs. Merkel, Mr. Obama emerged to warn Donald Trump that he would have to be prepared to stand up to Russia and that he mustn't strike any deal with the government there that would put countries like Syria at risk of further suffering. There was, of course, a lot to discuss. And today, I think, was also a lot about legacy. Barack Obama has been very keen to secure that controversial free trade deal, TTIP, between America and Europe. It's really floundered. It's enc encountered significant resistance. We know Donald Trump doesn't really like uh, free trade deals like this. Nevertheless, whilst it hasn't been signed during his administration, Mrs. Merkel today said she wanted to persevere with negotiations on that. She, of course, herself faces challenges from the kind of populism that swept Donald Trump to victory. There's a general election here uh, next year. Mrs. Merkel has yet to announce whether she'll stand. But Today, Mr. Obama was asked, were she to stand, and were he able to, would he vote for her? He answered with a rather ringing endorsement. It's up to her whether she wants to stand again, and then ultimately it will be up to the German people to decide uh, what the future holds. Um, you know, if, if I were here and I were German and I had a vote, I might support her. But, it's, I don't know whether that hurts or helps. By and large, Germany will be sorry to see Barack Obama go. In addition to being a very close ally politically, he's also a very popular figure here. But he's reassured Germans that he will be back again to visit in an unofficial capacity because, as he said, he has yet to experience Oktoberfest. Well, now a look at some of the day's other news. The U.S. Surgeon General has said drug and, drug and alcohol addiction should be seen as a treatable disease rather than a character flaw. In a new report, Virek Murthy said more than 60 million Americans lived with substance abuse that only one person in 10 was receiving treatment. He described addiction as one of the most pressing public health crises of our time. And the American bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, has agreed to pay $264 million to settle allegations that it hired the children of Chinese leaders to win business in the country. U.S. authorities said awarding prestigious employment opportunities to unqualified individuals in order to influence government officials was corruption. Witnesses at the trial of a man accused of murdering a British MP have told the court how a man stabbed and shot the Labour politician Joe Cox and saw him walk away calmly from the scene. One said he looked as though he hadn't a care in the world. Thomas Mayer, who's 53, denies murder. A group in the European Parliament, which has a large majority of UKIP MEPs, is alleged to have misused more than half a million euros of EU funding. It's claimed the money was used to help the party fight UK parliamentary seats and boost its Brexit campaign. The UKIP MEP, Nathan Gill, says the allegations are obviously a witch hunt. We're going now live now to our Brussels bureau to help hear more from our Europe correspondent, Damien Grammaticus. So, Damien, yes, how did these allegations come about? Well, these, uh, these allegations would come about because the European Parliament uh, has uh, been investigating auditors from the European Parliament, the funding uh, that that body gives to European uh, political groups that operate across Europe. Now, this group, the ADDE, it doesn't sit in the Parliament itself, but uh, operates across Europe, bringing together Eurosceptic parties. Now, about half of its members come from 
the UK Independence Party. And what the auditors say is that this uh, half a million euros uh, relates to money that the group is claiming which it should not be claiming expenses for and was money spent uh, in UK constituencies on things like opinion polls, on hiring uh, consultants who actually were linked to the UK Independence Party and therefore it said was indirectly financing that party in its local activities, not its European activities. And how was this money supposed to be spent? What was it meant to be spent on? Well, the idea is that the European uh, Parliament provides funding to these European groups uh, in order to promote European democracy uh, and to promote the sort of participation in that democracy across the continent. So uh, things like party activities Europe-wide, uh, but not certainly uh, activities related to either national elections or national referenda and the, the problem here is that the auditors say the money was spent uh, related to UK parliamentary elections and the UK Brexit referendum. And is UKIP going to appeal this decision? What, what's next? Well, UKIP itself, itself says that it's not at fault here. This money wasn't spent, it says, by UKIP itself, but by this pan-European group that it belongs to, the ADDE. Uh, it has described this as victimisation. The ADDE, for its part, uh, has said uh, that the, uh, it will appeal to the courts, but it said it's perfectly confident that its spending was within the rules and describes this uh, as an attempt to silence critical voices, sour grapes, if you like, because of, it, of that winning referendum in the UK on the part of the European Parliament. That's its argument. Damien, thank you. That was the BBC's Damien Grammaticus coming to us from Brussels. And the world's largest dementia experiment in the form of a computer game has uncovered how the older we get, the more our sense of direction declines. It's worrying. It's estimated that around 48 million people worldwide suffer from dementia, and getting lost is one of the first sy symptoms. A team at University College London believe its findings could ultimately be used as a test for the disease. Here's how the game works. And now, a pair of marigolds, an egg cup, and a bucket. Among the items on display at the newly revamped Design Museum unveiled in London today. Not perhaps the first things that come to mind if you're thinking of the best of British design, but the new museum is full of surprises. Our arts correspondent, David Salito, had a look. This is more than just a beautiful new building. It is, in many ways, a personal project by a man who helped change the way we live, Sir Terence Connell. Hmm. How did you feel when you walked in? Oh. This is the great day of my life. To see the place <laughs> actually finished. Over the years, through his shops and designs, he introduced millions to a new continental way of living. French cookware, flat pack furniture, duvets, a transformation that began in 1951 in the Festival of Britain. I just saw the faces of people coming in, in their long Macintoshes with their sandwiches and the smiles. <laughs> They hadn't seen anything cheerful for so long. 
65 years on, that Festival of Britain's spirit lives on. It asks many questions about how we'll deal with change. For instance, robots. How comfortable are we going to be with them, especially when they're interacting with us? I think he's following me around, isn't he? But also, how comfortable are we going to be in a changing world? Apple computers, the angle poise lamp, British design has blossomed. London is the global hub of creativity. And, you know, the sooner government realises this and, you know, demonstrates its enthusiasm for design, the better. A shrine then to the ideas that have changed the world and the role played by Britain. David Solito, BBC News. Now, scientists in Mexico have discovered an intriguing secret. Within an ancient Mayan pyramid in the east of the country, a third structure has been found, revealing it was built like a Russian nesting doll. The pyramid dates back to around 1000 AD. It's hoped the discovery could shed light on the original Mayan culture before it was influenced by other groups from central Mexico. And Prince William is at a conference in Vietnam along with representatives from 40 countries. The meeting's aimed at curbing the illegal trade in endangered wildlife parts. Progress has been made in shutting down the industry, but some places are resisting international pressure to change. One such place is Wa State in eastern Myanmar. Our correspondent Jonah Fisher obtained rare permission to visit the area. He discovered that a region once notorious for opium production has now moved into other illicit trades. The mountains of Wa State were once covered with poppies. Opium grown here on the Burmese border with China was turned into heroin and smuggled around the world. Now after years hiding from international view, the Wa say they've cleaned up their act and invited us in to take a look. This is one of the most secretive places on earth. It's easier to get permission to go to North Korea than it is to go here. Hello, how are you doing? Hello. Wa State is about the size of Wales, and though technically part of Myanmar, it's really a state within a state. This is the capital, Pankam, and this, the rebel army. Back in 1989, the Wa signed a ceasefire with the Burmese government, giving them full autonomy in return for peace. Judging from what we see, the Wa have stopped growing opium, but they haven't kicked the drug habit. This ceremony is to burn some of the two tons of methamphetamine that was seized this year. But plenty still reached Asian markets, and many believe that Wa leaders are directly involved in the billion dollar business. It's a view unsurprisingly rejected by the local police chief. He accepts meth is a big problem, but says foreigners from China and Thailand bring the raw materials in and that the Wa are blameless victims. Late one night, we give our minders the slip and make a depressing discovery. It's a supermarket selling endangered animal parts. This is a pile of tiger bone bracelets costing more than $1,000 each. These are tiger skulls, pangolins, elephant bones, and this carved tusk is priced at about $18,000. The women say they can arrange delivery to China. We've counted at least six of this type of shop in this quite small town. It's clear that when it comes to producing drugs and dealing in animal parts, the Wa make up their own rules. Uh, Meeting the Wa leadership to talk about the animal trade wasn't easy. But in the end, they agreed, rather strangely, to do it from the presenter's chair of their own TV station. In Wa State, we don't have places where wild animals live. We cut down all the forest to plant rubber. But you tolerate it. This is people trading freely. You buy from me, I sell to him. The state's not taking part. Great efforts have been made to expand the regulations that protect endangered animals. Enforcing them in a place like Wa State is almost impossible. Jonah Fisher, BBC News, Pankam, Wa State. 
And finally, the winners of the Comedy Wildlife Photography Awards have just been announced. Have a look at this collection of fantastic pictures. Let me just show you some of the best. The winner is this one by Angela Bulk of a fox trying and failing to catch his breakfast in a snowdrift. Then there's this beautifully timed shot by Adam Parsons of a bear with some fetching headgear. And this camera-loving polar bear cub shot by Philip Marazzi, he got a special mention from the judges. Meanwhile, Mario Gustave Fiorucci clinched the Portfolio Award with, this, with these images of the family of owls posing for the camera. Well, that's all from the program. Next, the weather. But from now, from me, Celia Hatton, and the rest of the team, goodbye.